Hello, it's Alistair McGrath again, and this is the last presentation in the series introducing my textbook, Christian Theology and Introduction. And as you might think is appropriate, this final chapter, the 18th chapter in this book, deals with the topic of the last things. And the technical term eschatology is often used to refer to this area of Christian theology. Although some more recent works in the field now prefer to describe this as the Christian hope. And this unusual word eschatology comes from the Greek phrase ta eschata, the last things, which is the title of this closing chapter in the textbook. It's a fascinating area of theology, which raises lots of questions that are hotly debated, but are really interesting. Here's a good example of the sort of question that was debated in the Middle Ages. What will the resurrection body look like? If someone dies at the age of 50, Will the resurrection body look like that of a 50-year-old? Or if someone dies at the age of two, will the resurrection body look like that of a two-year-old child? Here's the answer that the early medieval theologian Peter Lombard gave. A person's resurrection body takes a form corresponding to their appearance at the age of 30, whether they actually lived that age or not. Why? Well, you can probably guess, because 30 is the age at which Jesus Christ died, which suggests that it should be considered to be the perfect age. A century later, the theologian Honorius of Autun reinforced this point like this. All the dead, an infant of one year as much as a man of 90, will rise with the same age and size as Christ when he rose, namely 30 years old. Now, I know this Sounds rather like pointless speculation, but actually it's a really interesting question. And it was clearly seen as important by many theologians at the time. And actually, it makes a big difference to Christian art. You might look, like to look at some medieval depictions of heaven and notice how so often the inhabitants of heaven all seem to be middle-aged. And my point is, there's a theological reason for this. And there are lots of other interesting debates and discussions that you can overhear in this final chapter. So let me explore the structure of this chapter and touch on some of its topics. It begins with a brief consideration of the eschatology of the New Testament, and the section outlines some of the major eschatological themes in the New Testament. Here are three, for example, that we find in the Pauline letters. First of all, the presence of a new age, in that Christ has inaugurated a new era or age, which has yet to be fulfilled, but whose presence can already be experienced. And secondly, the resurrection of Christ is an eschatological event which affirms the new age really has been inaugurated. Or thirdly, the gift of the Spirit is seen as a confirmation that this new age has dawned in Christ. The gift of the Spirit is a pledge affirming that the believer may rest assured of ultimate salvation on account of the present possession of the Spirit. So lots of interesting stuff there. We then move on to consider a range of Christian writers who explore these themes. Examples include Cyprian of Carthage's ideas about paradise as our homeland, Augustine of Hippo's landmark idea of the two cities, and Dante's Divine Comedy, which represents a poetic and imaginative reworking of eschatological themes. I personally find Cyprian of Carthage's comments on eschatology in his third century treatise on mortality very interesting. This work was written at the height of a pandemic in Roman North Africa that historians now call the Plague of Cyprian on account of Cyprian's vivid depiction of its impact on Carthage. And this pandemic was so destructive that it fatally weakened the Roman Empire and hastens its end. Now, Cyprian interprets this whole thing theologically. Heaven is portrayed as the native land of Christians, from which they have been exiled during their time on earth, and the hope of return to their native land to be reunited with those who they know and love offered a powerful consolation in times of plague and suffering. But one of the most influential reworkings of the corporate aspects of the eschatological ideas of the New Testament is found in Augustine of Hippo's City of God a work which was written in a context that I think could easily be described as apocalyptic, namely the sacking of the great city of Rome and the growing realisation that the Roman Empire might be about to collapse. And a central theme of the work is the relation between the city of God and the city of the world. 
For Augustine, believers live in an intermediate period, separating the incarnation of Christ from his final return in glory. And the church is to be seen as in exile in the city of the world. But while it's in the world, it's not of the world. The church is exiled in the world, but maintains its distinctive ethos while it waits for redemption. Augustine doesn't agree with Donatist ideas about the church as a body of saints. Rather, it's all about the church sharing in the fallen character of the world. But one day, at the final day, this will be resolved. We then move on to look at other approaches, for example, the Enlightenment's dismissal of eschatology as a kind of primitive superstition. And then we look at some of the exciting developments of the 20th century. For example, we look at Rudolf Bultmann's controversial demythologization of eschatology, Jürgen Moltmann's important idea of the theology of hope, Helmut Thielicke's reconsideration of the relation of ethics and eschatology, and Pope Benedict XVI's statement on the Christian hope found in Spes Salvi. So let's look at this last one. Spes Salvi is a document that picks up the theme of being saved in hope, found in Romans chapter 8. After setting out the idea of hope found in the New Testament, this encyclical letter engages secular visions of hope, such as that we find in Marxism. And after exploring a general cultural disillusionment with secular visions of progress, Spes Salvi offers a restatement of the Christian vision of hope. The Christian hope is to be seen as realistic in the light of the failings of its secular alternatives, and the document reaffirms the importance of hope in the face of suffering. And so we go on to look at the classic themes of Christian eschatology, the ideas of heaven, hell, the millennium, and purgatory. And in each case, we map these out looking at how these ideas were developed, how they've been um, explored in the Christian tradition, and who develops these ideas, and what do they say. And I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a fascinating topic, and I'm sure you'll enjoy working through some of these ideas and trying to evaluate them. So let me mention just one aspect of the Christian expectation of heaven, which is a beatific vision. And this refers to Christians finally being granted a full vision of the God who up to this point has only been known in part. Anticipating this glorious vision of God in the full splendour of the divine majesty has been a constant theme of much Christian theology. And Dante's great work, The Divine Comedy, concludes with the poet finally capturing a glimpse of God, which he refers to as the love which moves the sun and the other stars. Here's how the 19th century artist Gustave Doré depicts Dante and his lover Beatrice gazing on God in this way. And the anticipation of the wandering glory of this vision was seen as a powerful incentive to keep going in the Christian life. As English poet John Donne put it three centuries later, no man ever saw God and lived, and yet I shall not live till I see God, and when I have seen him, I shall never die. Now, with this closing chapter, the textbook comes to an end. Although it's covered a huge amount of ground, I think many readers will find yourselves wishing that more topics were covered. And I hope that this introduction will have served its purpose well, both by creating an appetite to know more and by giving you the skills and confidence you need to take things further. I've also tried to whet your appetite to know more so that you will end this book feeling dissatisfied and want to go further. I think that's really all that a book like this can hope to achieve when dealing with so rich and complex a subject as Christian theology. So I hope this introduction to the basics of Christian theology will have encouraged you by showing you that you can cope with exploring some of its leading ideas and interact with some of its seminal texts. And you can find a lot more of these texts all very carefully introduced in the companion volume to this work entitled The Christian Theology Reader. But I will be providing other resources, including some short video presentations on theological topics you may find interesting. I'll interact with people like C.S. Lewis uh, to show you how you can do theology, not just think about it. So watch out for this new material, which you can find on YouTube and Vimeo. Again, you're free to use and distribute this in any way you like, so long as it's not for commercial purposes. But 
it's time for me to say goodbye for the last time. If you find these presentations helpful, do tell others and pass them around. They're, they're my gift to you. And it's my pleasure to help you in this way. I must also thank all those in Oxford and London who helped me think through how best to teach theology. But I want to thank you, watching this presentation, for the privilege of being part of your journey of theological discovery. So I wish you well in your future studies, wherever these will take you. Thank you very much for the privilege of allowing me to introduce you to Christian theology. I hope you found it interesting, enjoyable, maybe even useful. Thank you so much. And goodbye.